Hiya, Doola Doola Sarah here bringing you Birth Bold Passions, Listening Without Prejudice, a podcast where I speak to people as passionate about helping create positive pregnancy, birth and early years experiences for all. This incredible podcast with Professor Kipros Nicolaides comes with a trigger warning if you are pregnant. In this juicy episode, we discussed many topics, including themes of risk and loss in regard to twin and multiple pregnancy. If you are pregnant now, while the information within this podcast is important to hear, you might want to listen with support or have your birth partner, doula or midwife listen with you or for you. We want to bring clear information about possible complications while also reinforcing the fact that with good support and good monitoring, the majority of twin and multiple pregnancies end with two or more healthy babies. Here I am with the incredible Professor Kipros Nicolaides, um, an incredibly warm and funny individual who, like me, has an innate ability to go completely off topic. I, I met him recently and he invited me to meet his team where we spoke about many things, including research into preeclampsia, calcium, twins, farmers with no teeth and how often we ought to be cleaning our bathroom have we got to the bottom of their last one yet Kip Ross yes <laughs> yes so, um yeah so do you want to introduce yourself a little bit well Sarah thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about things that are very close to my heart I uh, many many years ago when I was about two years old I was asked as to what do I want to do when I grow up and the answer unlike most normal people that would say uh, an astronaut or a footballer I said I want to become a doctor and the reason for that was very very simple my father was a doctor one of the very first doctors in my area in uh, Cyprus and it was an era where they did not even have antibiotics so people were dying from simple conditions that are now cured from. And instead of buying a car to show off how important he was for being a doctor, he bought a donkey. And he used to go around from village to village, um, staying with people until they got better or they died. And when they got better, the whole village was celebrating. And when the patient died, uh, he would go to their uh, funeral. So he was a very much of a, a people's doctor. So as I was growing up and he was taking me to the villages with him, it became very clear how much love he was deriving from the people, how much trust he had, and how medicine for him was very holistic, something that became very popular several decades, decades later. Uh, you don't try to diagnose uh, why somebody is coughing and give them some antibiotics and then get out of the house as quickly as possible uh, to see the next patient. But you place the symptoms of a disease within the context of their life. Mm -hmm. uh, how these uh, people were living a very poor and miserable life in the, in the villages. Uh, how uh, if it rained too much or not enough, their crops uh, were not uh, doing well. And therefore how their poverty was affecting their own life. And he showed me the way of being part of the life of people. And that has remained with me in subsequent years when I became a doctor, where for me, uh, when I look at a couple uh, that have a problem, uh, pregnancy, uh, the, the, the challenge is not just what to do with the pregnancy itself, with the fetus, uh, but uh, to become part of the family, the importance mm -hmm. of understanding and sharing with them uh, the, the, the tragedy when things go wrong or the happiness when things go well. So this is where I come from. I arrived in England. Um, I was uh, sent off when I was 17 uh, to become a, a doctor. I didn't have any choice. I didn't even think about it. It was an impulsive decision. My father said, I will do. Mm. There was no option in, a, in some respects. And I joined the medical school at King's. And this was the 1970s, when they were, there was a lot of poverty, there were a lot of social unrest in England. We had 
the miners start strike and mm -hmm. you know uh, the, the the whole society was polarized but also um, in the aftermath of the Cold War between Russia and America, there were revolutions in many different countries, there were dictatorships and so on. So I found myself being a political activist uh, much more than a medical student. I was not really too excited about anatomy and histology and pharmacology and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it all very uh, boring until the very last year of the medical school, when a young, brilliant, enthusiastic Scottish guy arrived as a new professor. And he was giving his inaugural lecture at King's. And he was a man that came from Scotland where they started using ultrasound to look at uh, the fetus. Yep. And I was so excited and seduced by his enthusiasm. And that often reminds me, and I often pass on this message to people, that you may find yourself lost in life and then suddenly one event, one person, one interaction with somebody and it gives you a direction that takes you for the rest of your life. I saw him after the lecture and I said, can I spend a few days with you in, in your department? Mm -hmm. And then for the first time I saw the moving images of the fetus on the screen and I immediately fell in love with this new field of medicine, fetal medicine. For thousands of years, the fetus was separated from the outside world by the maternal abdomen. Um, mm -hmm. and then suddenly that iron curtain is broken and you look inside the uterus and you see a completely new life. But then you start wondering, how is this baby growing? Uh, what is the interaction between the baby and the mother? Uh, how do things go wrong? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you diagnose problems inside the uterus? And then can you intervene uh, and improve the condition of the baby? So after that one interaction, I decided to become a fetal doctor, but there was no such thing as fetal medicine uh, wow. in 1978, 1979. Uh, hardly any women were having an ultrasound scan. Um, so I qualified in medicine. I was told that there is no such thing as fetal medicine. I had to become an obstetrician and gynecologist. So I joined the team of Professor Campbell at King's and soon I became a research fellow in the early 1980s. And suddenly every single thing we were seeing every day mm -hmm. uh, was a new discovery. Mm -hmm. So from a very junior doctor, I was becoming internationally one of the fathers of this new field, a, 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 an extremely young, um, enthusiastic uh, father. So that's how life carried me along uh, in the subsequent decades. Um, many people were coming from all over the world to observe what we were doing and their brains were joining our brains in getting new ideas on how to uh, create new methods. In relation to twin pregnancies, one of my research fellows, two of my research fellows, uh, Yves Ville, who is the biggest uh, name in France now, Professor Yves Ville in, in Paris, um, was encouraging me uh, to do something about the twin pregnancies that were miscarrying all the time in front of our eyes. Can we do something about that? Mm -hmm. And another doctor, who is now the most important doctor in Germany, uh, Kurt Hecker, uh, they were both research fellows with me in the early 1990s when we introduced um, laser surgery for twin to twin transfusion syndrome. But how did that come about is in itself interesting. Yeah, what, what did make you, um, what, what did draw you to have a specialism in twins and the expert that you are in, in the care of twins and multiples? Like many things, um, you don't see it in your drawing room and come up with inventions. Uh, you're, 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 you're sucked into new areas of, of, of research and clinical study by what you observe. Mm -hmm. In 1992, entirely uh, by accident in a sense, I noticed 
that in fetuses, in the 12th week of pregnancy, uh, there's a collection of fluid behind the neck. Mm -hmm. Fluid by ultrasound is black. Mm -hmm. And I refer to that as a nuchal neck translucency. Mm -hmm. And that uh, created a new area of interest. At 12 weeks, we could measure this collection of fluid behind the neck and predict whether the baby was going to have Down syndrome. And then soon after that, other chromosomal problems. And then soon after that, uh, abnormalities of the heart and different parts of the body, genetic conditions and so on. Mm -hmm. So somehow from 1992, during that decade and beyond, the measurement of fluid behind the neck and a 12 week scan became a very dominant uh, part of our interest. I, at the time, in order to find out whether really my observation about nuclear translucency and problem pregnancies was true, I invited women from in and around London to come to our unit. And our unit was located on the ninth floor uh, of uh, King's Village Hospital in a horrible place <laughs> um, with one lift going up, most of the time broken. So it was good exercise for pregnancy. We were having to walk <laughs> up for nine floors. Uh, come in any day of the week until midnight and any weekday to have a free ultrasound scan. And people were coming in their thousands within a very short period of time. We collected many tens of thousands of women to validate the relationship between this collection of fluid behind the neck and problem pregnancies. But of course, at that time, uh, every two in a hundred women that were coming in for a scan were found to have twins. And very soon, uh, we started looking at the twins and then we realized that we could easily tell by just looking at the appearance of the twins and the, and the placentas that they had and the membrane that was separating them, whether they were monochorionic, identical sharing the same placenta or mm -hmm. dichorionic. Mm -hmm. So here entirely by accident, we were thrown in this new discovery, discovering twins at 12 weeks. Before that, twin pregnancies and singleton pregnancies were having a scan at around 20 weeks. And many of the identical twin pregnancies that were suffering from severe pregnancy complications like twin to twin transfusion syndrome were miscarrying before 20 weeks. So it was a condition that did not exist. Yep. Death from pregnancy complications in twins. And actually one of the very first papers that we wrote was about the hidden mortality of monochorionic twins. It was hidden because nobody knew why a woman would have miscarried. It was passed out like everything else as a, an unfortunate event and forget about it and get on with it. But mm -hmm. by scanning women from 12 weeks, suddenly we were able to distinguish the outcome of monochorionic with dichorionic twins. We were seeing that if you had a dichorionic twin, by the next scan at 20 weeks, the rate of miscarriage was only one to 2%, mm -hmm. whereas in monochorionic twins, it was about 12%. It was a lot more. And yeah. we were trying to understand why should these women be miscarrying? And then we realized that by following them up uh, every few weeks, that they were developing twin to twin transfusion syndrome or selective growth restriction, conditions mm -hmm. that we can discuss later on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we felt that we need to do something about it to prevent these babies from dying. What was the, 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 the treatment at the time was to do an amnio drainage. You have excessive fluid impulsively, put a needle inside the uterus and drain the extra fluid. Mm -hmm. so we're draining the fluid. And then a few days later, the women were blowing up again with fluid. Mm -hmm. And the babies were dying and we were watching these babies die. And then we felt that there must be something we can do. We realized that the problem was one of connecting blood vessels within the placenta between the two babies. And there was a passage of blood from one baby to the other without an equivalent mm -hmm. return to the first baby. And then we said, okay, one baby is a donor 
a net loser of blood and the other is a recipient, a net gainer of blood. And what we need to do is interrupt the passage, uh, the road. Um, and at the time, ultrasound was becoming better. We could characterize the, the evolution uh, from 12 weeks to 16 weeks and so on of the, of the various complications. And then laser and endoscopic surgery was very much becoming part of general surgery. I remember as a medical student uh, and as a junior doctor, one of the worst possible things that I could do is be in an operating theater with a surgeon trying to remove a gallbladder. The student, the junior doctor would sit with what you call a retractor, a terrible uh, metal uh, uh, spoon, pulling the organs away from the field of vision of the surgeon. And we sit there, not seeing anything, just pulling for one, two, three, four hours until the mm. gallbladder was removed. And then suddenly in the 80s and 90s, people in surgery were beginning to introduce endoscopy, minimally invasive surgery. And now you remove a gallbladder uh, as, a, as a sort of a, a few hour uh, procedure and then you get rid of the patient the same or even uh, the next day. You don't have a massive cut and several hours of an operation. So endoscopy, telescopes, um, and doing surgery through telescopes was generally introduced in surgery. And it doesn't take too much intelligence to say, here we have a problem. <laughs> we think we need to block those blood vessels. Mm -hmm. There are new telescopes that allow you to enter potentially the uterus, theoretically safely, and use laser, which was also being widely used at that time for other things in postnatal medicine, and see whether you can block the vessels. So we think about it. We watch women lose their babies. We get depressed, we get frustrated. And then we say, can we try something new? Can mm -hmm. we go in and use these endoscopes, identify the vessels and use laser to cut them? And that's so, how it all came about. So if just, just to, because uh, we're going to come back to this in a bit, but just to, to for people that don't know that are listening, um, what are the different types of twins? And just to, as well within that, because of um, you might we might as well kill two birds with one stone. But you know, obviously, as a mother of um, twins that develop taps in utero, um, and a doula that supports twin families, I'm very aware of the complications that can affect twins and multiples that share a placenta. And I really would love for you to explain something that no matter how many any, how many ways people try and explain it to me, I still quite can't quite grasp it myself, but how does so first of all what what are the different types of twins and then how does a twin placenta work so one placenta that has one or more uh, babies attached to it Thank is you. that a big question <laughs> yeah it's a short question but it has to be a big answer <laughs> so first of all twins there are two types of twins monozygotic and dizygotic one uh, sperm enters one egg and produces one baby and when you have uh, two eggs being released and two sperms uh, uh, infiltrating, uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, being ca coming inside the, the egg, you produce two embryos, two babies. There are two separate eggs, two separate sperms, and those are dizygotic. Okay. Those babies will go on to develop their own uh, placenta. They are sharing um, a block of flats. Uh, they, they, they live in two block in the same block of flats, but they have their own uh, flats. So if one of them is a bit smelly, it doesn't interfere with the happiness <laughs> of the other one. They're in the same block of flats, but they have their own own environment. Okay. Of course, if the, if the block of flats is bombed, uh, then they are both affected. Uh -huh. uh, if there's a fire, they're both affected, but otherwise they can carry on living their own lives independently from each other without too much interference. Mm -hmm. And then we have the other situation where uh, one egg is infiltrated by one sperm. So you start off with one embryo. Mm -hmm. At some point, 
uh, during the subsequent few days, the one ball of cells, as it starts off growing, mm -hmm. tears itself apart to produce two separate babies. So they have the same original sperm and egg, the same genetics. They were meant to be one, and then suddenly they tear themselves apart to become two. Now, those are dizygotic, two uh, monozygotic. They are one zygote, one embryo that splits to pr produce two. If the splitting up occurs very, very early, mm -hmm. they also have um, their own placenta. They are also living in their own flat and they don't need to say anything to each other. Mm -hmm. But if there is a delay by a few days before the splitting happens, then they're stuck with the same placenta. I'll come back to that. If the splitting is a few days later, mm -hmm. not only are they stuck with the same placenta, but with the same suck. And if the splitting happens even a few days later, they're stuck together forever. And that's mm -hmm. conjoint twins. Mm -hmm. So I always advise people in a relationship, if they want to split up, they better split up early. Otherwise, <laughs> stuck, stuck together forever, for good or for bad. And, and all of those things that happen within a few days, the splitting within the first, it's a, 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 a series of threes. If you split in occurs in the first three days, then you have your own placenta. Uh -huh. If the splitting occurs between day three and day uh, nine, uh, you have a single placenta, if about two sacs, and if it's between day nine and 12, you then have the same amniotic cavity, monochorionic, monoamniotic. And if it happens after day 12, you're conjoined twins. Okay. When we have twins being created out of the one embryo, I often explain to people the concept of Christmas crackers. Now, what is this concept? You have one ball of cells that's mm -hmm. right together, and it needs to be torn apart to create two. But when you tear the ball of cells into two, the tearing apart may produce like the Christmas cracker may produce two equal uh, parts that are mm -hmm. similar to each other. Mm -hmm. And then they have a balanced situation. But if the splitting as in a Christmas cracker is unequal so that one gets the present and the other is left without the present, mm -hmm. then the one that is deficient will have a smaller placenta, has less cells for its own development, and because it has a smaller placenta, it will not grow as well. And that okay. will lead to selective growth restriction. Uh, and if there's an unequal flow of blood between the two, it will lead to twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And that in many respects, or at the level of our current understanding, is just something that happens without us understanding why sometimes the splitting is equal and at other times it's unequal. Okay. Some people think and they promote the idea that within the same ball of cells, although we believe that all the cells are the same, in reality, as the ball grows, some of the cells begin to differentiate in a different way. So the so called identical are not completely identical, they are nearly identical but there are sufficient differences between them. And the group, the revolutionary group, the terrorists that are <laughs> differentiating and growing in a different way are pushed away from uh -huh. the bulk of the cells. So it's not a love affair, but actually it's a rejection that produces right. the twinning. But we do not know if that is true or not, but that is one of the hypotheses mm -hmm. being uh, promoted. Yeah. 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 So that's yeah. I think that some people um think that twins that um the way I kind of try and explain it uh, in 
the most rudimentary way that I can, the only rudimentary way that I, I can, because I'm very rudimentary, but is that a lot of people have this misconception that a shared twin placenta is like two trees growing next to each other and that they've created their own sort of their own um, uh, roots um, and that they magically connect up. Um, and I try and explain that, no, this is a this is a placenta that has grown uh, with the with the twins uh, attached to it. And they are. Uh, am I right that they are dependent on each other to survive in the room, in, in the room, in the womb, in the block of flats? Uh, it's, it's very interesting. We <laughs> always refer to mono chorionics, mono Greek one, mm. chorion is the placenta, one placenta. In reality, that is not true. Okay. Monochronic twins have three placentas. What do I mean by that? There are, what is a placenta? So placenta is the roots of the tree. So blood is pumped out of our heart, mm -hmm. goes down into the umbilical cord, and then when the umbilical cord hits the placenta, it breaks into a series of blood vessels, mm -hmm. the branches of the tree or the branches of the roots. And then each root, each little blood vessel goes and finds a small area of its own placenta. Okay. At some stage in my life, I was doing some experiments with sheep when we were trying to develop new methods of fetal uh, surgery. So I had the great misfortune uh, of going uh, and doing ultrasound scans uh, on sheep, and, 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 and the smell was horrible. <laughs> you have to bend up, the, uh, you have to try and shave them, and then they are peeing on you and all the rest of it. And then you're, you're trying to do an ultrasound scan and look at the placenta of the, uh, of the sheep. In the sheep, the placenta is made of a lot of little placentas. That are not, they're separate. Mm -hmm. And in each blob, you have one blood vessel bringing in blood mm -hmm. and another blood vessel coming out. Right. So you push off dirty blood mm -hmm. from yourself into this placenta. It gets rid of the rubbish and it picks up the goodies and oxygen and it comes back. So one vessel in, one vessel out. Yeah. Well, the woman is not completely like the sheep, but it's similar. There are little placentas, many, many, many little placentas that are just stuck together. But each little placenta supplied by one vessel going in and one vessel coming out is independent of each other. So okay. within a placenta uh, in in, in monochrome twins, there's a, an area where a group of these little placentas belong to one baby. A blood vessel from the same baby goes in and comes out. Another group where the supply end uh, in and out supplies the other baby. And then there's a group of little placentas in the middle where a blood vessel goes in from baby one and then a blood vessel from baby two comes out. If you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So actually, all in all, we have three placentas, one that entirely belongs to one baby, another that entirely belongs to the other, and the middle bit where vessels go in from one baby and they come out into the other. And it is that that is causing the problem, that shared bit of little placentas where the blood vessel from one comes in and the blood vessel from the other goes out so that one baby is bleeding to the other. If you have the same number of little placentas where blood comes from baby A to baby B as those where blood comes from baby B to baby A, a then the, the pregnancy is balanced. But if there is an unequal number of placentas where there are more of the type where blood from A goes to B than the yeah. other way around, then baby A becomes a net loser into baby B.
Okay. So not one presenter, not two, but three or many more. Yeah. Well, you've just blown my mind, literally. Um, so what is it that causes some twins that share a placenta, or, you know, uh, monochorionic twins? Yes. What causes some of them to develop TTTS or TAPS? or uh, selective fetal growth restriction well selective fetal growth restriction is is when one twin has less of the sort of placenta than the other yeah. Yeah. um but what is it that causes what triggers ttts or taps do, do we know or is it we don't, we don't really know all we know is the differences in the architecture of the placenta that you observe in these different conditions and the difference in the behavior of the pregnancy. But what exactly causes it, what triggers these uh, changes, we do not know. So if we want to take each one of them, in twin to twin transfusion syndrome, in general, the two separate placentas are similar. Mm -hmm. And the problem is in the connected placentas, where mm -hmm. there are more of the type that cause bleeding from baby A to B rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. But actually, in most cases of twin transfusion syndrome, the two babies are similar in size. It's just that one receives more blood and the other loses blood. The baby that is losing blood tries to preserve his blood flow by peeing less and therefore less fluid accumulates around that baby. And the other one that receives too much blood is like me taking you to the pub and, and, and forcing you to drink 10 beers in an hour. You have too much blood and then the consequence of that is to pee a lot. And that produces too much fluid in the one baby, the recipient, and not enough in the donor. And that is what creates then the problem because you produce excessive fluid in mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. that stretches the uterus and that can trigger off a miscarriage or very premature birth. And also because the small baby is losing blood and blood also means oxygen, mm -hmm. that baby can die because of lack of oxygen. And the other baby, uh, the, the, the recipient has too much. And because it has too much, the heart is pumping a lot more, they go into heart failure and they can die because of the heart failure. This is twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Yeah. In selective growth restriction, each baby has its own placenta and then the shared bit of the placenta. Mm -hmm. There's no problem here with the shared bit of the placenta. Okay. But the problem is with the separate placentas. Okay. One of the babies, because of the Christmas cracker hypothesis, has received a lot less cells and therefore creates a lot smaller a placenta for itself. So this is like a singleton pregnancy where the placenta is not working very well and that baby is not going to grow very well. And whether it survives or not, it depends on how bad is the placenta. If it's a disastrous placenta, the baby's going to die at 16, 18, 20 weeks. Okay. If it is quite bad, but not disastrous, the baby may last for as long as 28 weeks. In which case, if you are monitoring them very closely and you see that the baby will be dying, if you don't deliver it, then you can deliver the baby and save it. And that is one baby's problem. The other baby, has a normal placenta, it's growing well, the sharing is fine, mm -hmm. there is no twin to two transfusion syndrome. Of course, there are cases of an overlap where you have twin to two transfusion and selective growth restriction mm -hmm. as well. In TAPS, it's even more strange and even more difficult to understand, less common. In TAPS, the two placentas are the same, mm -hmm. uh, the common placenta is the same, and there are minute little vessels, minute little vessels, which produce twin to twin transfusion. But unlike the usual twin to twin transfusion, where you have a lot of vessels being involved, um, here you have minute little vessels, mm. so that there is a gradual bleeding from one baby to the other, and the baby that is losing blood becomes progressively anemic, 
-hmm. And the other baby becomes polycythemic, excessive hemoglobin. And the baby that is losing blood can die because of anemia. And the baby that is receiving too much blood can die because of polycythemia, we call it mm. too much blood. Uh, the normal hemoglobin level is about 12 grams per deciliter, 12. Uh, in men, it's a bit higher than in women, and in smokers, it's a bit higher than non-smokers. But let's say it's about 12. But exactly the same is true for a fetus. It has a normal hemoglobin of 12. In TAPS, the one baby becomes severely anemic, and the hemoglobin may drop to as low as uh, 2. If your hemoglobin drops to below 2, you die. Um, while the hemoglobin is dropping from 12 towards 2, you are, in an intelligent way, the fetus tries to survive. In mm -hmm. what way? It increases its circulation. It's like moving a house and you either call in a lorry and get rid of all of your belongings in one go, or if there, there's no lorry, you, you, you just hire a mini car, in which case you have to do a lot of uh, a, a lot of journeys to achieve the same thing. So in the case of progressive anemia, the baby is, is, is pushing blood faster. And we can see that by looking at the blood flow in the baby's brain. It's a good way of uh, measuring the velocity, how quickly the blood is, is going round. And the more anemic you become, the faster the blood goes round, mm -hmm. and therefore you can predict how anemic the baby is. Many decades ago, before your times, but at my times, in the 1980s, when I started with fetal medicine, one of the major problems that we had in England was rhesus disease, where a woman mm -hmm. that has a blood group of rhesus negative, if she has a baby that is rhesus positive, mm -hmm. she develops antibodies to kill off the red cells of the baby. And in these cases, the antibodies cross the placenta, they destroy the baby's blood cells, and the babies become progressively anemic until they die. And in the 1980s, I discovered and discussed a method where we can put a needle by ultrasound guidance into the umbilical cord, take a blood sample, mm -hmm. find out how anemic the baby is, and then just inject blood as we would in an anemic patient after birth. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of babies that were dying were saved because we were giving these blood transfusions. So I knew very well how babies from anemia were behaving. Mm -hmm. They were becoming anemic. The velocity of blood in their circulation was becoming faster. I knew exactly the point at which the babies were very anemic. And I knew exactly the point that, at which I had to give a blood transfusion. They also knew exactly the point at which the babies decompensate. They cannot go faster anymore, and then they just die. Mm -hmm. and I described all of that in the 1980s. Well, here we are now, uh, 30 years later with TAPS, we are observing exactly the same story. You start off with a normal hemoglobin, you're losing blood, you're becoming progressively anemic. It may not be too bad, and mm -hmm. you can tolerate your anemia, mm -hmm. uh, or it may be very, very severe, and you cannot tolerate it, and you will die. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to, in a very simple way, by looking at the velocity of blood in the brain, predict how anemic the baby is. I have uh, published this in the 80s and in the website of the Fetal Medicine Foundation. You can go in and free of charge, of course, um, put in the velocity of blood and how pregnant somebody is and work out what is the hemoglobin. And the big game is a drop of hemoglobin from 12 down to 2. When it drops to below four, it begins to become very, very serious. Below two, you are extremely likely to die if you don't do something. Yeah. So that is the anemic baby. But the other baby is not well either. Yeah. Because the other baby is receiving too much blood. Mm -hmm. And now instead of the hemoglobin being 12, it becomes 16, 18, 20, 25. But when you have a lot of hemoglobin in your blood, Blood is just like having a very thick, and very viscous blood, which is not circulating so easily. The opposite mm -hmm. of an anemic baby where things go faster. Here, the blood is so viscous that it cannot go fast enough. And again, the velocity of blood in the brain goes down 
and you can predict how polycythemic the baby is. So here we have a situation where one baby could be at risk of dying because of the anemia, and the other baby at risk of dying or becoming damaged because of the polycythemia. And this is TAPS. So yeah. different yeah. conditions, they are sufficiently different from each other, but quite often the management is the same. And the management is what? Recognize that these pregnancies are at risk of any one of these complications, uh, take them very, very seriously, yeah. uh, and, 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 and do ultrasound scans at very regular intervals by people that know what to look for mm -hmm. and to act on their findings. Mm -hmm. Often, unfortunately, I keep hearing that a woman turns up, uh, she complains of, of, of pain, and her healthcare professional may tell her, don't worry about it, it's twins, and that's why you're feeling pain, and then the next week she miscarries, mm -hmm. because they fail to recognize that the discomfort was a consequence of too much amniotic fluid. Mm -hmm. Or the woman says, I'm not feeling the baby's move, or I'm not feeling one of the baby's move. And you say, don't worry about it. Drink some chocolate drink and, and, and everything will be all right. Well, the chocolate drink will not cure anything. All you need to do is have a scan by somebody that knows what to look for. And then based on your findings, then you tell somebody go and have a chocolate drink because everything's all right. Mm -hmm. Or off you go to a center where they know what to do and intervene and save the babies that would otherwise be dying. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not it's not enough to just do monitoring. It needs to be good monitoring by somebody who knows what they're looking at. Yeah. You don't do a scan just to measure uh, how the baby's growing or, or, or to look at whether the baby has a, a hair with a cleft palate. That should be done as well. Yeah. But actually, you need to pay a lot of attention knowing the three important conditions twin transfusion, selective growth restriction, and TAPS. And look at the age uh, and do the measurements and also do the blood flow measurements, the Doppler in the umbilical cord, in the uh, ductus venosus, a blood vessel that supplies the heart, and in the brain, mm -hmm. looking for three different things. Is the baby lacking in oxygen? Mm -hmm. Is the baby uh, having lacking in hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. So you need to make a diagnosis to send them to the right place. But sometimes you don't even need to make a diagnosis. I, I, I cannot expect that every sonographer in England is going to become a super person knowledgeable in twins, but they should be able to recognize what is normality and what is odd. Mm -hmm. And when they see that there's something odd, they must send somebody immediately, the same day, as far as I am concerned, to somebody- The same special. day. And I always say, if somebody calls uh, and tells us that uh, we have a, a, an identical twin pregnancy and there's something odd, I tell them not tomorrow, the appointment is today. And the women must come, even if it's at midnight, I don't care, they're going to stay behind and see the woman tonight because if you ask them to come tomorrow, it may be too late. It may be too late, it, yeah, yeah. And I, I know of women that are left, two days to wait for when they've got you know symptoms and fluid discordance and size discordance waiting two days for somebody to do a doppler reading on them right. to yeah and um it's 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 heartbreaking. every machine every ultrasound machine has doppler on it and in the old days when i was uh, training we did not have color on the doctor, and you had to try to identify, for example, when we're looking at the blood vessels in the brain, we had to work out exactly where we expect the blood vessel to be, and then try and see whether you can get the waveform, the Doppler from that. But nowadays, you just press a button and you have color lighting up, which tells you, I am here, put the Doppler gate on me, and then you will get a waveform. Yeah. It, it, it takes, Seconds, I find it extraordinary. All the machines in this country, in every country, have a Doppler element on them. And, and there are only three vessels to look at. And somebody who has, who has trained uh, in, in, in becoming a sonographer, they just need to spend two minutes more during their scan. 
to do the Dopplers. There's no need to refer anybody to another center. To but do the you can do it there and then. Do the bedside sonography machines yes. have this ability as well? Absolutely, they do. Wow, because I've had, I've had clients tell me that no, they don't have them on the. They've they've been told that they don't have them on the machines. But I, you know, this year I've supported two women who have ha be, had their their multiple pregnancy misdiagnosed. And how how easy is it to misdiagnose a multiple pregnancy? I think that you can misdiagnose anything in, in <laughs> life if you do not know what to look for, really. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> if, if there's a crossing in, uh, in a road and, and, and you don't look left and then right and then left <laughs> and start walking, you're dead. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. simple. I mean, what, what is the diagnosis? That in the road there are cars and if you don't look out to avoid the cars, you will be killed. Mm -hmm. is that, I mean, that, that is so obvious. The same is true. If you know that we are dealing with a monochronic twin pregnancy, whether there's a chance of one in six, one in six, really, that something will go wrong, the, the most serious, the most risky type of pregnancy of all, uh, and, and you don't look at them in great care each time you see them thinking that things may be wrong. You, you must not become paranoid. You must remain positive mm -hmm. in encouraging the women that things are well. But, because, but before you tell them things are well, you better make damn sure to exclude things that are not well. But if I take the high blood pressure of pregnancy, mm -hmm. two or three in a hundred, mm -hmm. one in 30, one in 50, if I take very severe premature birth, mm -hmm. one of the main causes of death and handicap in obstetrics, um, two in a hundred, mm -hmm. 150 again. If I take monochronic in pregnancies, and there's a chance of one in six that things will go wrong, mm -hmm. every time you see a woman with a monochronic in pregnancy, you say, my God, am I going to do a scan now and find something seriously wrong? Mm -hmm. If you start with that, frame of mind to make them sure that before you lift the transducer off the abdomen of somebody, you have checked that the babies are equally growing, that the fluid around them is similar, the blood flows in the umbilical artery, in the ductus and the brain are similar and normal. And then you can tell them things are well, let me see you again in a week or two. But unless you have done those three things, you cannot abandon the patient to the lack of the gods. And do you think that, that currently that NICE guidelines reflect the best monitoring and treatment protocols for these the, conditions? So the, 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 the problem with NICE guidelines and Royal College of Obstetricians guidelines and everybody else's guidelines is that it's nice for people to sit down and, and, and produce guidelines, mm -hmm. but that is not the end. And every now and then we have disasters in England Mm -hmm. from maternity care, and then after 10 or 20 years, uh, somebody goes and produces a, a report that says in the previous 10 years, mm -hmm. things in this hospital uh, were disastrous. The mm -hmm. women were left to die, babies were left to die or become damaged. Yeah, and how interesting. <laughs> Why didn't you act 10 years ago and you had to mm -hmm. wait for all this suffering before you, 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 you produce a report? And then everybody runs around like headless chicken quite often to implement changes today. No, that's not how things should be done. Yeah. Um, you can put your guidelines, but your responsibility does not finish in writing a guideline. A lot of mm -hmm. the guidelines in relation to the monitoring of things is what we introduced in the 1990s. When I was describing, you see these pregnancies at 12 weeks, make them sure that you can distinguish between monochronic and dichronic. We mm -hmm. wrote the first papers on the lambda sign and the, and the T sign mm -hmm. of the distinction between monochronic and dichronic twins. And if you have a dichronic twins, tell them things are stable. They look normal, the babies, they're growing well. I'll see you at 20 weeks. But if they're monochronic, you have to see them at 16 weeks. And if 
they are monoclonic, you also look very carefully from 12 weeks to see signs that one baby is smaller than the other, mm -hmm. that the fluid behind the neck of one baby is smaller or higher than the other. And you may have to see those women at 14 weeks. Mm -hmm. And from then on, if everything is perfect in each visit, you see them every two weeks, but if there's any deviation from the average in the size, the fluid or the doctors, then you see them every week or, or twice a week. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look a lot of, it, so eventually what we were doing in the, in the 90s became incorporated into nice guidelines. And then what? What steps are you taking to make absolutely sure that in every hospital in this country, there is an availability of well-trained sonographers mm -hmm. that can examine the patient, know what to look for, do Dopplers there and then, and then if there is any deviation from normal, pick up the phone and request for these women to be seen the same day, not in a week, mm -hmm. not I have done a scan and you can come back in a few days for doctor. To me, that is completely unacceptable. And, 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 and you can write as many guidelines as you want, but unless you implement the obvious, mm -hmm. you, you are not, uh, our responsibility does not begin and end with writing guidelines, but in implementing those guidelines, in training people uh, how to do things and how to respond to their findings. Wow, just gold, absolutely gold, and just a hundred percent exactly how I feel about it. Um, it is unacceptable not to be doing the very best um, by these women, and and it's not happening. And I, 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 I wish that it is. And I've come to the point where last week I shared the videos from your website on how monochorionic and dichorionic twin pregnancies are diagnosed and what to look for because I'm sending the message to women and families to become their experts in their own pregnancy so that they can when they get scanned they can look for these these things and say oh can you show me where the lambda sign is can you show me where the t sign is you know um because but we should they shouldn't have to do that but that's where unfortunately we are in the vast majority of the country well done sarah that's exactly what i also did over the the decades and that's why in my website i have the same uh educational material for mm -hmm. doctors and sonographers and the patients themselves there's only one target group anybody that is interested Mm -hmm. I try to make things equally simple for all three groups of professionals, the woman, who is the most important, mm -hmm. that is pregnant, and uh, the people that are taking care of them, whether they're sonographers or doctors. Mm -hmm. Quite often, the women themselves, it's sad, but they know more than the people that are looking after them. Mm -hmm. I realized that in the 90s, early 90s, with the nuclear translucency. Mm -hmm. That is why I campaigned with women's groups, because the women themselves that were pregnant, they were more knowledgeable than their professionals, and they were going to the hospitals, and they were demanding uh, things to be done, and the sonographers and the doctors did not know uh, more, the women knew more, mm -hmm. uh, and it took me then from 1992, when I first described the, the importance of the nuclear efficiency, until 2006, when it became implemented in all of the hospitals. And I was tearing my hair for those 14 years, uh, fighting within the system and everywhere else with women as the mm -hmm. allies uh, for this scan to be offered to all the women. That was very angry and frustrated, but it took 14 years before women in general could have the benefit of this scan. Of course, the women that were wealthy could go and pay for it. But to me, my objective was to give access to all of the women in this and many other countries of the world to this scan at 12 weeks. The same is very true nowadays with twins, where mm. uh, often the women themselves 
at taking the initiative to demand from the system mm. uh, to have a standard of care that the system is not prepared to offer to them. And you need to continue to campaign mm. for that to happen. And the driving force for change for the better are people like you and the pregnant women themselves. Yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. We've got to we've got to improve things. We've got to a hundred percent. I mean, I called, so there's a report that comes out every now and again, diff- various different things, em- Embrace report, which I'm sure you know about. And um, I called them the other day um, because I'm like, I am like a little chihuahua. Um, and I, if I want to know something, I will tr- do what I can to find the answer. So I just thought, Good just ring you. them. And one of the recommendations was that re, that um, every incident of uh, stillbirth in twins and multiples was investigated um, to, to find out what was going on. So I rang them and I said, OK, so this is the recommendation. And, you know, it's a bit like the guidelines, you know, yeah. the recommendation suggests that you can follow it but you can choose to not follow it as well. So I said, do you have a different reporting system for twins and multiples? No. So how are you going to investigate these stillbirths of twins and multiples? Well, it's for the hospitals to do. Okay, all right. So um, then I, I'm, I'm sort of moving through this with them and sort of exploring it with them. And I'm like, mm, okay, so what about in um, a use are you suggesting that uh, placentas are being sent for pathology to find out what was happening there? Um, well, that again, it's up to up to the hospital, and we've got a shortage of neonatal pathologists in the UK. And I said, okay, right. So, how many are being sent? And they said, in twins and multiples, um, it's twenty five percent. I'm surprised that it's that high. <laughs> I strongly believe that it's a lot less than that. Probably. Or In- said to people that know how to examine the placenta. Because, again, like everything else, uh, you know, if you have a Mercedes car, it is better to be seen when things break down. In a Mercedes garage, they, they, they have a better expectation yes. than an average garage. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Well, in and, and I said, okay, so what if um, the the parents don't want a um, post-mortem of the stillborn baby. Um, how many are sent then? And they said 65%, which is still not an, is a low number, you know? Um, and I'm just thinking, so... So Sarah, tell me again, 60%, 65% of the parents do not want to have a post-mortem. No, it, it's 65 in in cases where the parents don't want to post mortem of the stillborn child, yeah. 65% of those placentas are being sent to pathology. If they do want a post mortem, they're only sending 25%. I see. I don't <laughs> see the logic for that, but anyway. Yeah. No, no. So, you know, I get off the phone and I just I feel, you know, super depressed again. And I'm thinking, we're not wanting to find the answers and not you know you and I you know are excluded yeah. from that but it, on on mass we're not wanting to find the answers and I'm it's 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 gut-wrenching for me because I do what I do not from a place of trauma because I have both of my girls here you've met them you know I'm right. I'm yeah I'm incredibly blessed but I want everybody to to have the same opportunity to have that blessing as I I did so what something that I wanted to ask you about was um which is something that um there seems to be massive questions about is optimal cord clamping in twins is it okay to wait longer than 30 to 60 seconds and if it is okay why and if it isn't okay why in a single term pregnancy there is good evidence now that by waiting for 30 to 60 seconds before cord clamping the baby receives more blood uh, and whether this baby is mature or premature, it is beneficial. They have a better hemoglobin. Uh, they are in a stronger position to resist the problems of, of the first few days after birth. So it is strongly recommended given a single pregnancy that you should delay cord clamping. In a dichorionic twin pregnancy, whether the babies are identical or not, 
If they have two separate placentas, then you should treat them like in a single pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But we have a problem with monocrear twins because if one baby is born and then we allow uh, delayed cord clamping, it is possible that the baby that has come out and is receiving blood is doing it at the expense of the baby that the baby that is still inside the uterus before it is born. But in some respects, one, once one baby is born, you should not delay cord clamping on that, uh, mm -hmm. on that case so that you don't compromise the second baby. But once the second baby is born, there is no damage to anybody else so that we can delay cord clamping for the second twin. Okay. The identical twins, yeah. I, I also think that because we aren't doing so well on mass, obviously not yes. you, but we're not doing so well. I always say to people that you might not know what's going on inside for those babies. So that's why you might want to consider, you know, carefully, you know, optimal cord clamping um, as well. Is that, is that, have I, have, is that, does that make sense to you or is that just me? It okay. makes complete sense to me. Of course it does. Okay. Course, yes. <laughs> I'm glad. So continue to campaign. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so Embrace has been publishing some very worrying statistics, and we've we've touched on um, Embrace a little bit already. But um, and they recognise that with better care, half of all twin loss could be prevented. What do we need to make our priority in order to make improvements? I I think that. The, the general recommendations that have been made are reasonable. Uh, now it is the implementation of those recommendations. Yeah. I think it is the responsibility of the Royal College of Obstetricians, the Royal College of uh, Sonographers and Midwives uh, to develop a strategy of uh, training and implementation of guidelines in each uh, hospital throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Education, 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 number one. And in an era where there are enormous shortages in many aspects of mm -hmm. the national health system, somehow uh, to compete for the little budgets that there are so that you gain a bigger part of the, of the pie. Mm -hmm. We are going through an extremely difficult period. We're going to have strikes by nurses, uh, we may well end up having strikes by doctors. Uh, the whole system is not receiving sufficient money. The whole country, so many things are not uh, receiving sufficient funding. And yet within this uh, terrible period that we are going through, we need to continue to campaign that more resources must be allocated for the care of twin pregnancies because they are the highest risk pregnancy. Uh, that there is. Mm -hmm. And the resources are not that many. The ultrasound machines are good enough. The sonographers should be good enough. They should, somebody that has devoted their life to or is doing ultrasound scans, they should learn within minutes mm -hmm. of doing Doppler. If you, <laughs> what do you, if you know how to image the head, and take measurements of the brain to see whether the baby is abnormal or not, you should be able to put a, press a button, see the color and put the Doppler on it and, and get a waveform. Mm. Or you find the umbilical cord and then again, put the color on and then get a waveform. It is so very easy. So the resources that need to be allocated for doing a proper ultrasound scan are minimum. The resources that need to be allocated towards ensuring that people are doing things properly, they are assessing the patients properly and they are doing the appropriate referrals are more. There must be a policing system that constantly checks that things are being done as they should be in each mm. hospital. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, you can choose to not answer this question if you like, because it, it, you know, it's a difficult one. But one of the things that frustrates frustrates me the most is the vast twin registries, like uh, twinsuk.ac.uk, which is out of St Thomas's Hospital. Um, that is a um, 
is a registrar of 12,000 twins and currently eight in in currently eight research areas, none relating specifically to twins and multiples, but where multiples are being used as participants in research studies. And when there's so little known about twins and twin pregnancy and, and birth and the life of twins, um, that feels to me a little bit unfair uh, and 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 um, just is incredibly frustrating. How do you feel about this? <laughs> I, I, I think the same as you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> but that is where in, in, in life you, you, you recognize that in all fields of life, there are many, many things that are not done the way that you believe they should be done. And there are two options, really. You go home and you have some tea and you say, well, that's life, or you campaign. And you're a campaigner, and so am I. All mm -hmm. my life, I have been campaigning for improving the care of pregnant women, whether they carry one baby or two or more. Mm -hmm. and I think we need to recognize that there are a lot of deficiencies in many uh, elements of registries, guidelines, implementation of uh, these guidelines, care, and we need to continue to campaign uh, for improvement. That's all I can say. So again, this is another maybe a tough question to answer. Um, again, you could choose whether or not you want to, but why, um, do you why do people seem to not be interested in improving maternity outcomes for twins and multiples and the lives of twins and multiples while also seemingly being so enamored and fascinated by them I think that you could argue the same Sarah for for single -term pregnancies uh, it is very sad that England one of the richest top very very rich countries in the world Mm -hmm. uh, spends so little on health, a lot less than France and Germany and other developed countries. Um, and we have one of the highest rates of stillbirth, mm -hmm. be twins or singleton pregnancies. Uh, they are not implementing things that to me are very obvious. A lot of the research that they have carried out over the last few decades should be implemented in the same way that we implemented screening for Downs now with mm -hmm. the new cultural exclusivity, but it took 14 years before that happened. I have carried out extensive research in the prevention of uh, premature birth, in the prevention of stillbirth, in the prevention of uh, preeclampsia. And I, I am continuing this research. A lot of it is being funded by myself um, and, and, and my own uh, charity. Um, we are finding major uh, new discoveries that if they were implemented, they would reduce death and handicap. And quite often you hit yourself against a, a brick wall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We will Heartbreaking. continue to fight. Yes, it is. Well, I mean, are there any new, new developments and treatments to support monochorionic twins and multiples? Any promising research right now? The, the most important research uh, arose in the 90s when we discovered the difference between the behavior of monochronic from dichronic twins. Mm -hmm. And over the decades, we became better and better in characterizing the different types of complications, the TAPs and the selective growth restriction and the, mm -hmm. um, the main method of treatment has remained endoscopic laser surgery. We have refined the technique over the decades. We became better in carrying out those procedures. Unfortunately, there are still uh, quite a few cases where things don't work out. I, I, I don't want to give the impression to people that we have magical uh, solutions to everything. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, people are trying to see whether uh, you can map the con co 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 connecting blood vessels by ultrasound and then try to obliterate them using ultrasound techniques rather than putting telescopes inside the uterus. I think we are a long, long way away from a success in that er era, in that area, if we will ever achieve a success. I do not uh, understand, like you don't understand and many others, why the questions that you were asking about 
why do some pregnancies seem to be going the selective growth restriction group, the TTTS group, the TAPS group? Um, we haven't really understood the, the rationale, what, what is triggering those uh, changes. Mm -hmm. And I think unless we understand them, we cannot hope uh, to produce strategies that can uh, prevent them. So I think that for the foreseeable future, we have to continue to deal with better diagnosis and timely management with techniques that we have available at the moment before yep. we can dream of alternative strategies. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. And what about, you know, there's, I always, you know, joke about me in, always introducing the twin shaped spanner um, because, you know, they always twins are always seems to seem to be the exception to the rule. And you were talking when I came and visited you in your uh, research center about how um, I think it was aspirin doesn't work in the same way for yes. twin pregnancy. Does progesterone help prevent preterm labor in twins? Any evidence so, for this? So I cut it out. <laughs> I, I, I have spent the last twenty years. Um, doing extensive research on those two major topics, preeclampsia uh -huh. and, uh, and premature birth. In the case of premature birth, we found that if we measure the length of the cervix in women during a routine 20 week scan, and if the cervix is short and you give them progesterone, you have a major reduction in the risk of preterm birth. In the case of preeclampsia, again, extensive research has uh, led us to find a method where at the time of the nuchal scan at 12 weeks, we can identify quite accurately the women that will develop the most severe types of preeclampsia and with aspirin, we can prevent it. So here are two major topics in obstetrics, premature birth and preeclampsia, where we have gone a long way towards identifying the high risk group and intervening to reduce the risk. Can we do the same in twins? <laughs> in the case of preeclampsia, the risk of severe preeclampsia in twin pregnancies is nine times, nine times higher than in singleton pregnancies. Wow. And yet we have no idea whether aspirin is useful or not. NICE guidelines are recommending it. I think that that is wrong. Mm -hmm. Because to recommend something impulsively without good evidence that it would be beneficial, mm -hmm. not only are you uh, being useful to the pregnant woman, but actually you are preventing further research that mm -hmm. may find alternative treatments. If we don't have a good evidence that aspirin works, and we don't, I think the best thing to do is find out whether aspirin works or not. Mm -hmm. And that is what I'm doing now. In, in a major multi-center study uh, that will cost me millions, but I think it's very worthwhile uh, to do. Does aspirin prevent preeclampsia in twins? We do not know, and we need to find out because if it does not, then we need to focus on alternative strategies. Yeah. In the case of premature birth, twins have a major contribution. We have less than 2% of pregnancies are twins, and yet they contribute nearly one in four of premature birth. So this small group of women have a massive impact on premature birth and premature birth is one of the most important causes of death and handicap. Does my strategy of progesterone work in twins? Well, what I do know is that the strategy of measuring the length of the cervix mm -hmm. works and we should be measuring the length of the cervix to find 100%. out who is at high risk of premature birth. But does giving progesterone to these women, as in the case of single-term pregnancies, work? Unfortunately, I did a major study where we were giving quite high doses of progesterone, starting from 12 weeks in all of the twin pregnancies. And the trial had shown that that was not beneficial, except in a very small number of cases where the cervix from the beginning was very short. Okay. Okay. Wow. So last question, 
Um, the 37 weeks yes. of, uh, birth of multiples, is it necessary with good monitoring? Yeah, this, so this is a, a quite, quite an important question. Um, mm. I think that when we look in general, let's again go back to singleton pregnancies, which mm. affects more people. I think that over the years, people realized in a general population, uh, when you go beyond 38 weeks, the rate of stillbirth increases. That is for the general population. Your question is, in a woman that is very healthy, that had a completely normal pregnancy with completely normal results of doctor and everything else, can you have a sudden death? I believe not. But the system is unable to provide such careful monitoring for everybody. And it is easier to say, let's deliver everybody by 40 weeks yeah. because we cannot afford or we don't have the sufficient expertise to offer everybody uh, mm. continuous and personalized monitoring. I think that the same, uh, Sarah, is the story for dichorionic, non-identical, or twins or twins with two placentas. Once you reach 37 weeks, the risk of stillbirth goes up, mm -hmm. but does it go up arbitrarily? Just everything is perfect and one day you just die? Mm -hmm. No, that's not the case. Again, the mechanism of stillbirth is that the placenta is not working properly. And therefore, if you are monitoring extremely carefully in selected cases, mm -hmm. you could push the pregnancy beyond. Mm -hmm. But it is safer overall as a, as a strategy to say, well, let's deliver them all at 37 weeks because we don't have the expertise to monitor them sufficiently to reassure some. Mm -hmm. So let's deliver them all. So I think that is what is happening and it's logical. Twin pregnancies, uh, the placenta matures, uh, ages about three weeks before uh, uh, singleton pregnancies. And when you go to monochorionic twins, there the problem is that even if you did not have twin to twin transfusion syndrome earlier mm -hmm. or TAPS, you may still in a few cases develop it later on. And once you have reached 34 uh, weeks, 35, 36 weeks, you say, for God's sake, let's get these babies out and let's not gamble that something mm -hmm. may go wrong from now on. And that is how these recommendations came about really. And, and, and I, was, I was recommending that from the early nineties, that if you have a, a, a monochronic twin pregnancy, don't, don't, don't play too much with them going beyond, for example, 36 weeks. Because in the very first paper that we wrote about this concept of hidden mortality, where we showed that a lot of monochronic twins were dying between 12 and 20 weeks because of twin transfusion. In that paper, we also showed that after 35 weeks, there was also an increase in the risk of death. And it was at that time that I said, monitor closely, look for evidence of pregnancy complications, and then get to 36 weeks and say, enough is enough. Will we get better? in years to come so that we can allow some women to go beyond that? I suspect yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you got anything, any final things that you want to say or? I want to tell the women that are pregnant with uh, twins that I hope we have not uh, terrorized them. <laughs> our discussions. But unfortunately, uh, when you have these type of discussions and you highlight uh, how things can go wrong, mm -hmm. then you can end up giving a very gloomy picture. I think that it is fantastic news when women are pregnant with uh, twins. Mm -hmm. In the vast majority of cases, they will have two beautiful, healthy babies like you did at the end of the day. There are pregnancy complications. And in many, many uh, occasions, uh, we can actually do things, even if yes. they're severe, to save at least one of the babies. So my message is, if you are pregnant with twins, enjoy your pregnancy and look forward to having your two healthy babies. Yeah. Uh, and, however, 
make it your responsibility yes. to demand from your healthcare professionals that they should give you the care that you deserve. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I have, I invite um, my guests to name their podcast. So if you could name this podcast, what would you name it? My God. <laughs> With a challenge. Um, a message of love and care for women with twin pregnancies. Oh, oh, Prof, that's lovely. Thank you so much. Wow, what another great podcast. Thank you so much, Professor Kipros, for agreeing to record with me. And thank you all for listening. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Until next time.